before I begin, this video is based on a limited reading with some source material, but tries as much as possible to create a reasonable discourse. Some parts are also quoted verbatim or paraphrased from work source in the description. I-33, also known as the Walpurgis Fechtbuck, is a sword and buckler manuscript written in the 14th century, its name attributed to the woman in the treatise named Walpurgis. The treatise likely originates in the south of Germany, and its association with the name Walpurgis may not be coincidental. Indeed, St Walpurgis, who lived in the 8th century, did travel in her later life to the south of Germany to do missionary work before being appointed abbess of Heidenheim. What's more interesting is her early life in Wimborne Monastery, a place that had what was known as a chain library, a sort of public library where books were chained to their shelves as not to be taken. Therefore, there's some association when it comes to manuscripts and St Walpurgis herself. The treatise itself may have been written as little as 30 years after Kudrun, an anonymous middle high German heroic epic from the 13th century which references club and shield or buckler, and in other cases sword and shield. The term Sherman, meaning fencing, is frequently used in such epics, romantic genres and sermons. In epic and romantic genres, teachers are Schirmeister and the student Schirmknaben, which both denote fencing. Blows are also referenced being Schirmslägen, and also in the context of a shield, Schirmschild. A practitioner was known as Schirmer, the implication of the term also denotes childhood or early adolescent training, coinciding with other martial and courtly activities. The Arthurian hero Vigalois at Artis's court is taught by his more experienced knights jousting, breaking lances, shooting or throwing javelins, and finally Sherman. Young Dietlieb is taught Sherman by masters and Gottfried from Strasbourg's Tristan is tutored in the activity from the age of seven. The term also applies to amusement, for example in Lanzelet, in which it is a pastime. This is also included in Player Garo's von den Blüchenden, Tal, as entertainment in the court. Indeed, sword and buckler was used recreationally or for religious events, for example during a reenactment of Herod killing of the firstborn. During the festival of fools, French monks would do this in reenactment with sword and bucklers. The term also was used to describe single combat or battle between two men, and here we get references to Schirmschledge, fences, blows or strikes. For example, in the epic Lauren, one person uses Schirmschlag to cut a finger of an opponent's hand, implying a skilled and precise strike. In contrast, the epic Valberan uses the same term to mean an enclosing move leading to wrestling, a more likely definition meaning fences move slash technique. An interesting tale places itself in Kudrin, where Vater visits the court of King Hagen and Queen Hilda in Ireland disguised as a merchant, who is entertained by fencing and javelin throwing, stating he has no knowledge of fencing. Hagen proposes he takes lessons from the best Irish Schirmeister at court, so he may know the quote-unquote three strokes, if he were ever in combat. It becomes obvious Vata knows his stuff and takes up a guard position, quote, as if he were a champion, end quote. The Meister is stayed by agility, leaping away like a wild leopard as Vata rains blows on his shield. After, Hagen proposes he fights Vata and shows him, quote, his four blows, end quote, in which he reluctantly agrees. The ensuing fight results in the spectators being fascinated by the skill displayed, Vate now telling Hagen he will repay him with the four blows. After, Hagen expresses surprise, stating, quote, You are praiseworthy in the ring. End quote. The reference to quote, three strokes and quote, four blows illustrates different fighting styles, with the quote unquote champion description possibly showing a guard. Another story, Trojanerkrieg has such Sherman as well. Paris and Hector, two noblemen brothers, go to a number of rings, possibly fenced off areas where they practice sword and buckler. Paris, younger and more inexperienced, strikes Hector more than necessary, considered an unmanly act. In retaliation, Hector intends to stab his brother through the hand, but is stopped by the shout of an onlooker. The way the combat is described is dynamic, with both men moving back and forth. The stance is also described, which is one of crouching or bending over the bucklers, which are held out in front of them. Such is described in Prosa Lancelot, 
in combat between four Sariandan, or foot soldiers armed with cudgels and bucklers, and the Duke of Clarence, who is armed with a sword and shield. All Sariandan throw their bucklers forward due to being inexperienced. The Duke of Clarence, who has knowledge in fencing, does likewise with the shield. Kudrin also suggests trial by combat, a type of trial that was determined whether the accused was guilty or innocent. It should be seen in the same light as an ordeal, and indeed was considered one, judging how the person withstood or failed physical pain or adversity, another example being a hand in boiling water. It occurred in situations where evidence wasn't clear, it was one person's word against the other, and was very personal and hostile, with the outcome showing falsity or validity of the crime with the fate of the accused being decided by God if human judgement could not be certain. If not killed, then the loser would be executed in the aftermath. Such was regulated by law and overseen by judicial officers, though this was often looked down upon by legal practitioners and, as will be mentioned later, the activity also included the clergy as well. In the context of sword and buckler fighting, it's no surprise that this seemed to be one of the longest lasting forms of combat in Western Europe, both armoured and unarmoured, with unarmoured denoting training, entertaining or judicial combat. This is evident in literary texts which depict a judicial process or settling a personal score. For example, in negotiations between two hostile forces in Bitarov and Dietlib, one nobleman notes that if the quarrel cannot be solved with sword and bucklers, e.g. in the judicial manner, then it can be done by quote, emptying saddles, unquote, in battle. Indeed, the recourse to judicial combat may show the art being taught to knights, nobility and the growing mercantile class as well, as well as for war as well. This is also evident in later fencing manuals such as Hanko Dubringer, Sigmund Ringek, Paulus Kahl and Hans Talhofer, which suggest preparation for judicial combat. It's no surprise then that I-33 reflects the preferences of its author and audience. This may give light to the fact there's a depiction of a priest, a man in clerical robes and a woman in the treatise. Though depictions of women are rare in judicial combat, examples such as Tauhofer's male in the pit between a man and a woman show possible cases. Heidi Marie Baudemer suggests that women as well as clerics would on occasion take part in judicial combat and Hermann Nortart notes the case of judicial duel between a man and a woman in Bern in 1288. Though Sarah Newman uses many studies to show that this may have been down to the quote, love of storytelling, end quote, and quote, the joy of depicting an quote unquote inverted world, end quote. While Purchase herself is in four illustrations and is shown in second custodia ending in a buckler strike and culling the opponent's face. However, she doesn't take up the second custodia in the form used previously by the Scholaris. She is more upright, with the buckler close to her body rather than extended, something suited to an individual lacking in upper body strength and to a taller opponent. With this, it may be safe to assume the treatise might have been made available to female practitioners as well. The context of monks practicing sword and buckler has historical precedence. This seems to largely come from France, where monks seem to have been fond of resolving disputes via combat, noted by Pope Innocent III in 1208. Charters of French abbeys in the late 11th and early 12th centuries show monastic communities pursued cases either against each other or local noblemen, resolved by judicial combat, however it's not clear whether the monks participated or employed a champion. An example comes in a quarrel between the monks of St. Serge and St. Albin in Angers, caused by a dispute over the building of a weir, which forced both to come to a financial agreement due to members preparing to settle the dispute using staves and shields. The abbot of St. Serge was more concerned with brother monks fighting than the actual fighting itself. In a wider context, Agar suggests that most combat fought by or on behalf of French monks took place during the 11th century. English clergy were also known to resort to judicial combat, according to Van Kynigem's collection of English lawsuits from 1154 to 1199, quote, One complicated, bitter and long-running lawsuit over profitable marshes between two Fenland monasteries show that judicial combat could still be preferred as the method of proof even after more quote-unquote rational methods became available. And during the dispute, the abbot of Crowland regretted that 
quote, he could not choose the jewel, end quote, because his followers at court did not include, quote, any strong young man, end quote. Hunt Yanin also discusses another case, quote, Trial by battle was occasionally used by monasteries to settle their differences. In 1287, the monks of Bury St Edmund in England were embroiled in a dispute over the ownership of two manors in Suffolk. The monks came to the conclusion that they had such a weak case that trial by combat would be better than a jury trial. The outcome of this duel, if it ever took place, has not been recorded. Sidney Anglo notes the employment of a champion, Roger the Clerk, and his trainer by the Abbot of St Edmunds in Suffolk by more than six months in 1287, in which Roger was killed in combat and the Abbot lost his cause, though this may be the same case highlighted by Yannin. Judicial combat between monks may have also been common in medieval Germany. For example, Hermann Nortab notes a series of these declared in Corvi in Westphalia in 1149, after the attempted murder of Abbot Windbold von Stablo by members of the monastery, though this did not seem to have taken place. Such could also take place under the auspices of the church, when neither participant was clergy. In 1521, combat took place in the courtyard of St. Barbo's Cathedral, the seat of the Diochies, from a dispute over the use of a forest. Notab also notes a similar case between a man accused of murder and his murderer, held in the cathedral courtyard in Cologne between 1227 and 1231, in front of the Stadtgraf, or Count, the Bishop and other clerical dignitaries. Both combatants fought barefoot with shaved heads, dressed from neck to foot in sheep's leather garments soaked in pitch. Their shields were made of willow, covered in leather three feet in length, with their staves of medlar wood, also three feet in length, sharpened at both ends and fitted with grips and rings, presumably of metal, in which the alleged murderer was defeated and executed. The depiction of the shield seems close to the one shown by Tauhofer, though these are much larger. Individual German churches and clerical institutions seem to have been anxious to gain and retain control over judicial combats in their local areas, particularly within the 13th century. Combats were held in front of the church in villages in Bremen, Holstein and Mecklenburg. In mid-13th century Silesia, the monasteries and other institutions voted themselves the right of control over all ordeals, including judicial combat, where the combatants fought with swords as well as with cudgels. The cathedral at Breslau ratified the monastery's decision in 1249, as did the cloister at Rauden in Silesia in 1258. So what can be said of I-33? The treatise shows combat within an ecclesiastical setting, inferring recalls to settle disputes. How was the treatise used? The use of tenses depicting the illustrations rather than active instruction when directed at the priest and student indicates the teaching rather than learning tool. In short, it's an instruction manual for the fencing master himself. The use of terms like langort and halbschild also indicated that instruction would be carried out in the vernacular. The author may have been a priest or monk appointed by the monastery, church or cathedral to act as an instructor for those challenged to judicial combat. The depiction of a woman in the treatise illustrates this point further in line with Tauhofer's treatise, which shows judicial combat between a man and a woman. The teacher himself may have been a former man of the sword, such as a knight, and may have recorded the techniques for other fencing masters, ultimately preserving the lives of those in judicial combat, also escaping ecclesiastical disapproval aimed at those taking part in combat for money. This is evident by the fact the text saw use after being written, with text and illustrations revised and errors corrected, with the treatise being overwritten where original ink had faded, suggesting it was useful as a manuscript.